Get ready to reclaim your life, discover inspiring stories, practical tools, and the path to true happiness. This is Reclaim Your Life with Irina. Let's begin the journey. Hello and welcome to Reclaim Your Life with Irina. Today's guest is Stuart Elliott. He is recognized for helping people break free from the mental prisons of negative inner dialogue and self-sabotage that keep them drained of passion and trapped in life that doesn't serve them. Welcome, Stuart. It is a pleasure to have you. Welcome, Irina. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, let's see what uh, value I can give to you and your audience. You know, that's the important thing. Yeah, so please share with us who is Stuart in your own words. Who is Stuart? Okay, well, that's a big question because I'm still wondering that myself. But I was born in the UK and um, I moved to Africa in 86 and lived, did an overland trip through Africa, then went back to live there for about 18 years. And then things started, you know, changing a little bit in my life. And uh, I was offered up an opportunity to come to the south of China to teach English as a second language. So I said, okay, if it's not too far north, I'm going because I like the warmth. I don't want the cold. And they told me it wasn't far from Vietnam. So I came here and that was in 2003. Uh, I'm still here, but I'm not teaching English because what happened was during the teaching and obviously all my life, I discovered that what I was made to do or what I was supposed to be doing was helping people get out of their own way. And that was the biggest uh, life Oh, I opened it in my life because my later classes as a teacher became life coaching sessions as the students had a high enough level of English. And they they started asking me questions about how they could fix this and how they could do this or whatever. And when they started connecting to that, their inner resources and making those changes. And the smile came from the heart that told me, yeah, this is what I've got to be doing. This is what I should be doing. And uh, it was just like a, a, a... a seamless transition, if you like, from being an English teacher to being a life coach. But looking back, the whole journey through Africa and living in Africa, everything else was all part of my education to give me the knowledge and the abilities to help people. So, you know, it's it's a long journey, <laughs> but a, a wonderful one. That's incredible how, you know, one type of life led you into what you do now. That's amazing. And traveling yeah. all the way from UK and now you're living in, in China, right? Yep. And if you'd have asked me at 16 or 17 or 18 what I was going to be doing at this age, I would have no idea. <laughs> because life, you know, I think life is, is, is the best teacher and it takes you in the direction if you allow it to and you're and you, you know, confident about following life. It takes you in the direction you're supposed to go. And that's a very, very big, big lesson. I think that we could all, you know, well learn from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Who did you want it to be when you you were growing up? Who did I want to be? I don't know. I didn't, I didn't really have any heroes. Uh, You know, there were times the movie came out and this person appealed to me and that person appealed to me. Um, But, uh, there was nobody who was a uh, prominent in, in my mind at the time. The, the person, I think, maybe over the last 20 years or so, who I've really connected to a lot more is Jim Rohn. Mm-hmm. I was lucky enough to see him when I was alive when I was living in South Africa. He came over there and he made a very, very big impression on me. Not only his wisdom, but his ability to connect to the audience and and. As he spoke, or he he did he varied his delivery, slowed it down, or he, uh, he changed the amplitude and things like that. He had that the whole audience in the palm of his hand, and he had that mastery of an audience. But that was coupled with the wisdom of the words he was saying. So I think he is somebody who, in the latter stages, has really become someone I would like to emulate. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, Jim Rohn is amazing. He is, yeah. If you could live anywhere, where would it be? At the moment, here. <laughs> but if 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 it wasn't here, it would be the wilds of Africa because I have a connection to the continent of Africa, the the wilds and the animals. And one of my goals is to help, um, not preserve, but but to keep Africa and the animals in in you know in a in a, in a symbiotic relationship. 
uh, the big problem is I've seen in, in, in certain countries is the, the wildlife is taken away from the indigenous people and used as a, to a, to a tourist attraction. For instance, there's a woman I know in uh, Kenya and she says she's lived here 30 years. She can't go to the game reserves because they're too expensive. It's mm -hmm. only for the overseas rich tourists. And I think that's criminal because it is part of her heritage. And if we cannot um, allow the, the local people to understand the value, but also to, to share the value of the wildlife, why would they bother protecting it? Okay. And that, that, you know, that's a big thing. So we, we've got to work at that level and let the people have access to the resources of their own country rather than taking it away and, and making it into just a tourist thing, which is, you know, is, is, is happening in some places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I didn't know that, that they only allow for tourists. That... Well, it's, it's a financial thing, you know, it's priced at the tourist level. So the local people don't have that much money, you know, and uh, it's a shame because it, it's their heritage. And it's, uh, it's not only in that country. I remember when I was living in South Africa, Botswana suddenly introduced a two tier price system where um, it was something like 15, 20 times higher for overseas people, for tourists, rather than from the local people. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a much better model where the people who lived in that country had access to the, the natural resources and people who wanted to come in were investing in the country and you know the, the resources that were there rather than just milking it. And uh, I think that, that's something that needs to be looked at and see how it can be done. Because again, if you don't value your resources as a, you know, an indigenous person, someone who lives in that country, why should you protect them? Yeah, yeah, you're right. What is your favorite thing about your career? My whole life has been my career. And, and looking back on it, the favorite thing is all the lessons that it's given me. And everything, you know, when I was 17 or something around that age, I had just been on a two week holiday in Morocco from the UK. And it was the beginning of May. And at that time of year in the UK, not many people have got a sun time because the weather's not so good. So I came back from two weeks in Morocco and I went to the pub and there was an old gentleman there. He must have been 70 or something around that age. And he just stopped and he just looked at me as I walked in. And he said to me, you're looking very, very brown. Where have you been? And I said, no, I've just been to Morocco for two weeks. And he just looked with these very deeply wistful eyes and such a sadness and uh, disappointment even. And he said, oh, I said, I wish, I wish I could have done that when I was your age. And I just looked at him and I said to myself in, in my mind, thank you so much for telling me that because I'm never going to get to your age and look back with regret. Things will happen, yes, good things, bad things, indifferent things, it doesn't matter. They're all opportunities to grow and opportunities to learn from. And it, I think partly it's that that gentleman gave me that lesson. And... Uh, you know, so when I look back on everything that's happened to me, it's all been leading me up to here and it's given me an ability to have more wisdom and, you know, the ability to understand a lot more so that I can help more people. You're so right. Yeah. Oftentimes we go through life and then we have these regrets because we've been living yeah. autopilot all our life. We were yeah. fulfilling mm -hmm. obligations or our mm -hmm. parents' wishes for what our life supposed to be, and then we feel yeah. unfulfilled in the end. And good for you for you know going and you know going to Morocco and doing the things that you love that you yeah. don't have the regrets. And, and the, the the one thing that also is very important, I think, is the fact that if we make a decision today, we make it with the knowledge, the understanding, and as the person we are. And if a month or two or a year down the line, we look back on that decision and say that was the wrong decision. We can't do that because we're a different person when we're looking back. Yeah. The decision we made at that time was the right decision because that's, that's who we are and what we needed, where we needed to go. And if, if it didn't work out, that's also wonderful because it's a, it's a lesson. It's an opportunity to grow from. But a lot of people, they don't look that way. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have done that. 
And then they start castigating themselves and that causes a lot of internal conflict. So I think, you know, looking back on a decision, just understand that you're not the same person now as you were when you made that decision. You don't have the same knowledge. You don't have the same experiences. So how can you say it was wrong? Because that has got you to where you are. Yes, yeah. There is no failure in life. Everything is a feedback. Yep, that's the whole thing, isn't it? And it's a wonderful expression. Don't ask me who said it, though, but <laughs> it's a wonderful expression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's one of the how you call it presuppositions of NLP. Yeah, but who who was it who distilled it? That, that's oh, I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it's very true. It's very true. Yeah. Yeah, and how you call it throughout your life? Have you continued to just following what you wanted, or was there a point in time where kind of something changed for you? Yeah, I mean, life is, is, is like that. There's, there's several things. I mean, one uh, was when I was in South Africa, the, the woman I was married to, we, we broke up and uh, everything fell apart as it was then. And at that moment, it was horrible. Don't ask me, you know, if, if you'd have asked me then, you know, if this is a good thing or a bad thing, obviously I would have told you how bad it was. But looking back on it, it's one of the most wonderful things that's actually happened to me because it forced, it forced me to change and to grow into ways I would, never would have done. And it also opened to my, my eyes up to a whole you know, side of me I hadn't seen because when you're living in yourself, you don't always see the truth about yourself. Yes. So, you know, that, that, that is one thing. And uh, there's, there's been other uh, eye-opening incidents with wild animals where they've just accepted me for being part of nature rather than uh you know a, a threat or even someone to you know to, to to have some fun with i mean when you're standing five ten feet from a wild elephant and it's just looking at you and saying ah, i see you it's okay don't worry we're all part of the same thing there's a special moment that happens there and uh you know i've, I've had that type of thing and uh, it's just so nice to understand the connection that we can have if we choose to whether it's with other people, the land, wherever you are, it's that connection. You, we, we have that ability to choose if we just become aware and then accept what's happening without any you know, uh, fear or any questions or anything else like that. And that's, that's a power that we all have, but we don't get taught it. It's a shame, really. We don't get taught the, the, the important things in life. We don't get taught about communication, about listening to people. We don't get taught about how... We always have choice. We choose to, uh, we, we consciously choose or we unconsciously choose by reacting or something like that. We're still making a choice. But we're not taught these things, so we don't know. And, and quite often we are just going on autopilot rather than saying, okay, this is happening. I accept it's happening. It's not what I want, maybe, but let me see what I can choose to do about it now because now I've got control, I've got power. And that, that's a very important lesson, I think, that should be taught at a very young age in school. Yes, you're so right. What were the three biggest lessons you learned since your wake-up call? Like after your, your breakup or after the nature that you shared? Well, one, one of the biggest lessons I had, and I only realized 100% what you know what it was at the time was when I was traveling through Africa and I was staying in uh, Kenya and we were in the Masai Mara game reserve area and we were camping <laughs> excuse me we were camping and um, out of nowhere one night three Maasai warriors came along and just started having a conversation with us and I saw this as an opportunity because I wanted to buy a Maasai spear but it was too expensive, I thought, when I was in Nairobi. And I, I saw it as an opportunity to, okay, I'm, I've got some barter goods with me. I'm going to barter this spear. And I thought, I've got this beautiful, because this was an 86, the scientific calculator with all the bells, the whistles, and everything else on it, you know. And I thought, it's, you know, it, it, it's going to be a given. So I showed it to this gentleman. And he looked at it, he played with it, and he said, oh, that's wonderful, he said. He said, but what use is it to me? And I just felt so small because I hadn't considered him as a person at that time. I hadn't considered 
what I was trying to exchange. I had no value. What's he going to do with this calculator? If a lion attacks his, his cattle, that's what he's feared for. I hadn't even considered how easy or difficult it would be for him to get another spear. And you know what's even worse? I never even thought about where the heck is he going to buy batteries for this thing if he took it because he's in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so, you know, that, 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 that was a, a whole load of lessons. And I ran away inside myself. I shrank inside myself. So there's another lesson there that came along later. But the first, the first lesson really is make sure you have value for the other person in, in, in whatever exchange you've got, whether it's a, a business situation, a barter situation, or just an interchange. Make sure that you've, you know, present him value and see the value in the other person. And if you make a mistake, this was the lesson I didn't even think about until a long time after, accept the mistake and say, okay, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Because that is a big thing that most people can't do and, and I couldn't do. I just wanted to disappear, you know. <laughs> but it was a beautiful lesson for me. And he was so noble about it. He wasn't angry, he wasn't anything. He just so, you know, really much, much more mature than I was and, and much better educated in the ways of the world than I was at that time. <laughs> just so that was a great practical. lesson. Like what am I gonna do with this? Yeah, this is it. This is wonderful. You know, he's thinking what it was, and, and I'm thinking I'm going to blind him because you know I'm I'm this idiot, uh, young young idiot. You know, so the, the, it, it was a great lesson, and uh, it you know as I say, the, the the full imports of it and the full things of it have only come along as I've got older and and thought back on it with more um, understanding rather than just uh, locking it away and hiding from it like I did at, at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we can learn something anytime if we choose to. Yes. And sometimes we have a lesson and we don't get the message from that lesson until much later in life. You're so right. What was your proudest accomplishment? My proudest accomplishment? I, I would suggest it was uh, when my eldest got, was born because I helped um, my wife with um, hypno hypnosis give birth to the baby. And the doctors were, they gave us a deadline and said they, they're going to be doing a Caesar. If not, and we wanted a natural um, childbirth. And uh, the deadline was getting close and I could hear them prepping the, 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 the um, operating theater, et cetera, et cetera. And I was basically connected to her, but I was also looking down on the whole labor um, um, ward or whatever you want to call it as, as a sort of outsider looking down on it and I could feel the connection between her and I could feel, hear the other people speaking and see that the nurse was doing this here and this person was doing something there and there's this and this and this and I, it was like I was three people and uh, they, they were so surprised because they didn't understand the thing I was saying to my wife because I'm speaking in English and she speak, they were speaking in the local Chinese dialect, the Guayan dialect. So afterwards, they said to her, they've never seen such a calm father. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't even know that I was there because my, my body was there, but I was, you know, everywhere else. And it was, it was a wonderful feeling to see the baby's head just appear and then everything just happened quickly after that and uh, know that it was, you know, part of my doing that allowed her to breathe because, you know, I don't know whether you, you've you've ever um, had children, Asha, but many people, when they get, um, how can I put it, when when they're in labour and the pain's there and it's all sort of fear and everything else, their breathing accelerates, but also the heart, the baby's heartbeat just rockets immediately, mm -hmm. and uh, this is what was happening. My wife was you know, getting a big, big stab of pain or something, and the baby's heartbeat went up to about 180, nearly 200 or something like that. So I just said, breathe. And immediately she breathed, and the baby's heart went straight down to the normal. And it was instantaneous, and it was that, that type of connection that was there, that we were there together. And as, as you know, as one of the things that was worrying the, um, the doctors was the umbilical cord was around the baby's neck so they were very worried about that but uh, it, that wasn't even a consideration to the baby <laughs> she came out on her own without any problems 
So, you know, that was a very proud thing. And, and obviously as a father and to be there, but to be involved and connected in that way. And that was, that was a special, very special moment. Yeah, that's beautiful. Your wife was lucky to have you, that you were able to. Oh, she said she couldn't have done it without me. So I assume so. <laughs> And, 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 and the doctors knew there was some magic going on there because but they didn't know what because they couldn't understand what we were saying to each other. <laughs> yeah. And and how how it's, uh, easy it is that, you know, we forget to breathe like the simplest thing when we are in the midst of fear or any situation, yeah. we get worried. We forget about this amazing ability that we have. Just breathe. Well, I think number one is we're not taught how to breathe. We never are. We just assume we know how to. And yeah, we can breathe a little bit shallowly or however, you know, but we're not taught the power of breathing. And, and that's another thing that I should, I think should be taught at a young age. Allow people to breathe because children go through a lot of, of challenges and fears and, and all they have to do is just breathe, just stop and breathe. And, and then all that nonsense goes away and then they're able to deal with whatever it is um, that, that's uh, upset them. So why can't we teach people that at a very young age? Because it's so fundamental in our life, isn't it? Yeah, yes, you're so right. Instead, we are taught all the stuff we're never going to use. Yep, and we're taught fear. We're taught how to fear ourselves, how to doubt ourselves, and how to not be as good as we, we could be, because that's the way the system seems to be set up. I mean... If you think of, of, you know, when I was at school, I got my homework back. I may have been proud about putting it in, but it came back. It was all crossed out and this was wrong. And that was a, that, and, and it, it deflates you. It really does. You know, what's the point in trying if that's going to happen? There's no praise for what you did right. It's all, this is wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. You, you can do better, you know, and uh, that, that's, that's, that's terrible. It's not a way to, to make someone um, um, confident or anything else like that. Yeah, you're so right. What what motivates you to work harder or to work hard? The smile. The smile on someone's face when they make that change. Ah. That is something special because you can feel that smile coming from the heart. It's that energy it's connected to it. And when they see when when you feel that and you see it on them, that means the world. Really, that, that just means the world. And if I could make one person smile like that, then I've been successful. Yeah. Awesome. What is your biggest fear? I suppose my biggest fears, two really, have been heights. I don't like heights and I, I can get very twitchy at heights. But before that, when, you know, when I was... Um, I don't know what age it started at, but I, I was always a very shy person. So I can remember being a teenager and going to parties and being the wallflower. I'd sit there and I'd say, please talk to me, please talk to me, please talk to me. No one would talk to me. And, you know, I, I didn't realize at the time, but that was actually a gift because I was able to see the interactions i was able to read the body language of people and see the energy exchanges because i wasn't involved in the conversations i was the outsider i was the fly on the wall but again that's another lesson that's came to me much later in life so i would suggest to anybody who's shy just to say okay this is wonderful look at what i can learn from being shy i can observe i can see things without you know people um, without being involved and missing the the signals the, the hidden signals that most people don't see so it, it it was a a gift in a you know in a way that i hadn't realized at that time because i was too involved in it mm -hmm. well i didn't know that like yeah i think you bring a, a good point you know even though shy people, we get to observe and learn yeah. more about uh, the world. And in communication, generally, we, we see things, we see the interactions between the people, we can feel the energy, we know when people are going to say or do things, but we don't realize that this is actually a wonderful opportunity to grow from. Yeah, yeah. What is the smallest thing you've done that had had the biggest impact in your life so far? Smallest thing. 
I I would just su suggest it's follow my nose because it's never seemed such a big thing. I mean, when I went to Africa, it wasn't a big thing. I'm just going to go there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I did that six month trip through Africa. I got back to the UK and got off the ferry and I said to myself, no, I don't like it. I'm going back. And three months later, I was going back. It wasn't a question of it's a big thing, a big move. It was just just like going to the corner shop to buy something. That's that's how it felt to me. So you know, it's a small thing, but it is, you know, if you think of it, it is a big thing because it's a whole life change of moving to a different continent. But it just didn't have that feel to it. And it was a similar thing when I came to China. They gave me a ticket to Guangzhou and told me someone's going to be meeting me in Guangzhou to take, you know, to give me the ticket to the final destination. I said, okay, no problem. That was it. <laughs> I mean, I could have had all sorts of doubts and fears, but it just seemed, okay, it's natural. It's, it's, it's you know, I, I didn't even think whether it would work out or not. I, I just accepted that this is what was happening. So it didn't seem like a big thing. It just seemed like a small thing to me. And uh, maybe that's because I had that inner trust, that, you know, somewhere along the way that I hadn't even considered. Yeah. You you didn't ask yourself like what could go wrong. You asked like what no, could go right. It, it what, wasn't. What can I... It wasn't. It, it wasn't even a consideration. I'm just going. I'm gonna get on the plane, and someone's gonna meet me. That's it. And someone did. I mean, I was lucky because when the the plane landed in Guangzhou, we had an hour on the plane landing to get to the the other plane taking off. Mm -hmm. And at that time, this is back in 2003, the airports weren't really connected properly. They were still going through renovation. So the international and domestic were, were, were you know, basically separate buildings. And it, it seemed like there was a food market between the two. Mm. So I, I, I'd got my suitcase, gone through customs and everything else and immigration. And there's a guy there with a sign with my name on. And I said, that's me. And he said, okay, come, 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 come. That was, that was his, his command of English. He didn't have any English. And I didn't have any Chinese, really. So he's off and I'm off running after him, running through what, what looked like a little market, street market, and we're going there and we're weaving through these little stores and then all of a sudden he stops at what looked like a supermarket checkout. And then he says, he gave the ticket to the girl and said, bye-bye, and he disappeared. And there, what? <laughs> no. This was the, the, the terminal to go to, go to the uh, domestic departures. <laughs> and then I had to walk across the, the um because I was late, I had to walk across the runway or the, the apron area uh, to to get to the plane. And uh everything worked out. There was no doubt, there was no question. It was just it was just okay, let's go. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. I think it's a great attitude to live your life by. Just go for it. Yeah, just do it. I mean, th there's always something which will you'll find a way if you trust. And unfortunately, a lot of people, they find a way to doubt. They find a way to question. They find a way to make it not work because they have this, this inbuilt fear or doubt. But if you just accept and just go, things work out in, in, in the most surprising ways. And you can have fun doing it. You know, you have wonderful stories afterwards to tell people. <laughs> so true. <laughs> what are you passionate about? Africa, wildlife, um, nature generally, and obviously my family, my children, and and that. But uh, my my re biggest connection is is really um, the African wildlife and, and nature, and how that can be in, or people can be incorporated into that whole scene, so that everyone can live in a you know peaceful, happy way. And that's something very special when, when we do it. And, you know, the other thing is we're all people. We're all the same. We're all different, but we're all the same. Why can't we all live together in that happiness and, and share the energy of the earth, the beauty of the earth together? I totally agree. Why not? <laughs> is there that's, any... that's something wonderful to aim for, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is there anything I haven't asked that you would like to share? I mean, I could go on talking about this and that for hours and hours and hours. So I think the, the most important thing is that people understand that they always have choice, how they react to whatever happens to them. And it starts with 
you know, uh, becoming aware of what's happening, whether or not they're, they're, they're triggered into a bad mood or, or uh, they're fighting or whatever, it doesn't matter. As, as soon as they become aware of it and accept that that is happening, they give themselves the power of that choice of how they want to react in the, you know, to that situation. It could be that they want to get angry. That's fine, but they've made that conscious decision then. And if we, if, we, if we just become more aware, and, and aware is a word that people hear, but they don't really understand how big a word it actually is and, and how much is involved with awareness. And then uh, immediately following the awareness is, is the acceptance. Just accept it's happened. I've just noticed it. Oh, that's wonderful. Now I have choice. Now I've got power over how I, I react and what I can do rather than I'm the victim. Yes. You're so right about choices. We have so many of them, but we often only see one choice and we always get triggered by our ego immediately and responding yeah. and being aggravated when we can choose because mm -hmm. it takes the same amount of energy to be angry, sad, miserable, or happy, excited, or whatever mm -hmm. we want to be. Yeah, and once we once we have that make, make that choice, we actually... Uh, have so much power over ourselves and our behavior and our life don't we yes yes so true yeah thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and your wisdom if people would like to learn more about you or work with you where would they go the, the best thing is is to go to uh, strategic personal growth dot biz forward slash dreams and then just book a, a call there and we can have a complimentary call and we can just discuss and see you know what it is they're looking for and whether i'm the person to help them mm -hmm. because you know just because i have a set of wisdom doesn't mean it's on the same page as somebody else's so we've got to make sure we're on the same page and if i can't help them personally then i'll find someone who can help them so that they will have that reward of, of the opportunity of being helped. And, uh, you know, I just love to talk to people and see how I can just make that little impact in their lives, which turns out something special for them. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I will be including all of the links in episode notes mm -hmm. so people can connect directly with you. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's my pleasure and thank you again for the opportunity to talk and thank you to your audience for listening and I just hope this can take one little nugget away and then they can make that smile and start improving their lives and that, and that makes everything worthwhile. <laughs>